Good evening, everyone. I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims, the Executive Director here at the Institute of Politics. It is an honor to welcome Admiral Michael Mullen to campus this evening for a conversation with Jennifer Griffin of Fox News. They've got a lot of ground to cover, and we're grateful for this particularly timely expert lens on the national security challenges facing our country. I want to mention a few upcoming events. Tomorrow, New York Times reporter Tatiana Schlossberg will speak on whether so-called conscious consumerism is enough to protect the planet from climate change. She'll be joined by Robinson Meyer, a journalist with The Atlantic, who is a visiting fellow at the Energy Policy Institute here at UChicago this quarter. Wednesday, Rick Stengel, former managing editor of Time Magazine and former Under Secretary of State for Diplomacy and Public Affairs, will be at the IOP to discuss fake news and fighting disinformation in the 21st century. Next Tuesday, the 29th, eight-time NBA All-Star and humanitarian Dikembe Mutombo will come to the IOP to speak on his philanthropic work in the Democratic Republic of Congo. You can sign up for these and other events at our website at politics.uchicago.edu. After the discussion, we will open up the floor to take questions from the audience. Please line up behind the microphone in the center aisle right here. We would love to hear from any first years especially. The question and answer period is the cornerstone of IOP events, and you are encouraged to come up. As usual, the first three questions will be for students, and we remind you that questions end in question marks. Uh, please, everybody, make sure that your phones are on silent. And now to formally introduce our speakers is Thomas Kresnation. Thomas is a student at the Harris School of Public Policy, and he is from Anchorage, Alaska. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 2018, meaning that Admiral Mullen, class of 68, is a member of his Link in the Chain class there. Outside his studies, Thomas co-hosts a podcast called Thank You for Your Service, which aims to bridge the divide between civilians and the military. Please join me in welcoming Thomas to the podium. In 2011, speaking at Admiral Mullen's retirement ceremony, President Obama said that if there's a thread that runs through his illustrious career, it's his sense of stewardship, stewardship, sorry. The understanding that as leaders, our time at the helm is but a moment in the life of our nation. And his sense of the responsibility we have to pass the institutions and people entrusted to our care safer and stronger to those who follow. After graduating from the Naval Academy in 1968, Admiral Mullen commanded ships and sailors for most of his 43 years in uniform. He learned to love the sea and the responsibility that comes with it. Those decades of responsibility meant that he was ready in 2005 when he was appointed to lead the entire U.S. Navy, and he was ready in 2007 when President Bush asked him to serve as the 17th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the nation's top military advisor. Admiral Mullen was ready to oversee the development of a new strategy in Afghanistan, to establish diplomatic relationships with world leaders, to spearhead the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and to represent the 2.2 million men and women of our military to a society increasingly disconnected from them and their challenges. Both during his time as chairman and since, Admiral Mullen has been an irreproachable steward of our military institution. As policymakers grapple with today's military and foreign policy challenges, all of us who care about the future of our country and its institutions should be eager to learn from the insight and advice of this extraordinary public servant. Admiral Mullen is joined in conversation tonight by Fox News national security co correspondent Jennifer Griffin. During her career as a journalist, Ms. Griffin has covered major world events from South Africa, Cyprus, Moscow, Jerusalem, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and now Washington, D.C. And if you aren't keeping up with her reporting on the developing situation in Northeast Syria, you should be. And she breaks most of that at her Twitter account, at Jen Griffin FNC. It's an honor to be here and to introduce our distinguished guests, Ms. Jennifer Griffin and Admiral Mike Mullen. Please join me in welcoming them both to the Institute of Politics. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And I'm so pleased to be here at University of Chicago with Admiral Mullen, who I have known for the past 10 years. And the reason I know how long we have known each other is that uh, when I 
first figured out that I was pregnant with my 10-year-old son, we were, had just stepped off a Black Hawk helicopter in Afghanistan in the Korangal Valley. I had morning sickness, and his aide knew that I was pregnant before my husband did. <laughs> <laughs> Admiral Mullen is, has a very interesting background for a, a military person of 42 years. Uh, he was born in Los Angeles to parents who were in the entertainment industry. Many people don't know that his mother was uh, the assistant to comedian Jimmy Durante, and his father was a famous Hollywood agent. So he comes to uh, this incredible career in the Navy uh, from this incredible world out in Los Angeles. He also, as Thomas mentioned, was a classmate of Jim Webb, Oliver North, at the Naval Academy. Both of his sons attended the Naval Academy. And I had the privilege of working at the Pentagon as the Fox News national security correspondent when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And so we, we traveled together overseas and covered a lot of stories together. Admiral Mullen. Jennifer. <laughs> In 2016, Michael Bloomberg uh, vetted you to run on the same ticket with him uh, in the 2016 presidential race. And in the end, he ended up, the ticket did not um, go forward. But would you ever consider running for president now? Is Michael Bloomberg considering running for president? No and no. <laughs> all right. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I get asked about Bloomberg all the time, and there are a lot of people, myself included, that think he'd make a great president. In 2016, uh, he was running as a third-party candidate, and I, I know precious little about this system, but it turns out um, a couple things. One is if you announce and you're a third-party candidate, you need to announce a, a ticket as opposed to, obviously, what we go through now, and so I thought he was vetting three or four people. It turns out he was only vetting me. Um, uh, and in the end, he decided, and then he gets, he, anybody's gonna do this, has to start at a certain date because you need signatures. He was prepared, he actually had office space in 50 states at that point in time, and he was prepared to start. And as I recall, I may have this off, it was like the 1st of March or the 5th of March, he had to announce in order to be able to get the signatures in Texas, which is going to be the first primary. And you go out and get a million signatures, and I think the number was 250,000 were validated or verified. Um, but he basically, and Bloomberg's a data-driven guy, he, he, uh, and he has two really good political advisors, but he came to the conclusion that he couldn't win. And, and in fact, he came to the conclusion that he would, that it would, he could get enough votes so that whoever ran would uh, not be able to get 270, you'd throw it in the House, the House is Republican, and they'd end up electing Trump. So how did that work out? You know, I mean, basically that's exactly what happened by other means. But he decided that he, he didn't want to take that kind of step, if you will, at that particular point in time. So that leads me to my next question. Yes. Well, just, just one other thing. I mean, it's not that like people haven't asked me uh, in that regard. They have. And for me, it's, it's such a different world. I mean, I experienced four years in a political environment as chairman, and it was very different from anything I experienced in my entire professional life. It is a different world, and politics is a different business. For, so for somebody like me, uh, or even uh, some other retired four-star, uh, to get into it, it's just a, it's a different game, and and these days I suppose it always has been. It's a blood sport, uh, and uh, are we prepared to play it that way becomes a question. So I've talked to a few retired senior officers who who uh, looked at this in the past, uh, and part of this is it's just not us, it's not our values. Uh, so it would be, uh, I think it would be uh, very difficult to do something like this. So speaking of that, Admiral uh, Bill McRaven yeah. um, got a lot of attention last week with the op-ed he wrote in the New York Times. Uh, yeah. Most of you know that um, Admiral McRaven was the four-star admiral in charge of U.S. Special Operations Command. He also uh, was in charge during the bin Laden raid. He, um, he wrote this article in the New York Times that I'd like to quote from because it was so unusual, and I want to talk to you about what your reaction to it is. He wrote, the title was, Our Republic is Under Attack from the President. He went on to say, and that he was describing how he was quoting four-star generals who he had recently seen at Fort Bragg at a change of command ceremony, and he said, 
the America that they believed in was under attack, not from without, but from within. These men and women of all political persuasions have seen the assaults on our institutions, on the intelligence and law enforcement community, the State Department, and the press. They have seen our leaders stand beside despots and strong men preferring their government narrative to our own. They have seen us abandon our allies and have heard the shouts of betrayal from the battlefield. One told him, I don't like the Democrats, but Trump is destroying the Republic. He went on to write, and this was the conclusion, it is time for a new person in the Oval Office, Republican, Democrat, or Independent. The sooner the better. The fate of our Republic depends upon it. Now, explain how unusual it is for a four-star general, even though retired, to write such, a, such an op-ed. What do you believe is behind it? You obviously are probably still in touch with Admiral McRaven. Is he, is, this, is he planning to run for president? Is this part of a political campaign? And do you think it is wise for four-star uh, retired officers to be writing such op-eds? So I think our republic is under attack. I just don't think a retired military four-star is the right person to make the statement. Um, and uh, I have a long history of uh, uh, speaking to the civilian control of military, which is who we are as a democracy. And, uh, and you didn't hear Jennifer say, Mr. McRaven, you know, it's Admiral McRaven. And so he'll always be an admiral and he'll always be referred to. And the message that comes out to an awful lot of people in America is this is where the military is. Uh, and in a way, he, he does speak to this. And, uh, and, and in fact, I've discussed this with him uh, uh, since I read it the other day. Uh, and honestly, because he knows my background on this, it was one of these things where he, he was waiting for my call. And I think the world of, I think the world of McRaven, believe me, we're, we're very close. Uh, but it is, uh, it is increasingly, one, it's increasingly difficult not to say something. Obviously, he feels very strongly about it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, yet, at the same time, uh, we're not we're we're a military that must remain apolitical. And once you start attacking the president from whatever party, in this case, obviously the Republican president, President Trump, you throw yourself on that political side, and it's very difficult to pull yourself back. And then you particularly people are reflecting that. I wonder if that's where the military is, or that must be where the military is. So I worry a great deal about it. It, it is very much a sign of the times. It's hard to not speak, because there's so much damage that's, that's, uh, that's happening right now, if you will, to the institutions that we care about, uh, for example, and to what we stand for internally and externally. Uh, uh, so there's a, there's a huge worry. I just worry that, that uh, he, uh, you know, another Admiral, Jim Stavridis, is routinely out on MSNBC. Barry McCaffrey, retired four-star general, routinely out uh, uh, historically. And I just think in the, the net is not worth it in terms of us having an impact on the change, even though these are extraordinary Americans who care a lot about the country and the institutions, you know, in which they served both for and with. What are your colleagues telling you behind the scenes that they're not publishing? And is there a uniformity of thought? In, and, and let's make a difference between the officer corps and the rank and file, because yeah. there may be a, what I'm noticing is there's a gap between those two. Well, there may be. Uh, I, I mean, I talk about this in terms of uh, my, my whole career, uh, and there may have been a gap between the officer corps and the troops my whole life. I and mean, we just never talked about politics. I could not have told you in the wardroom of my ships or when I was stationed uh, at the Naval Academy uh, in the 70s, we just didn't know each other's politics. Um, and it was understood it wasn't any of our business. And, and more importantly, it wasn't part of, of, uh, of what we did. I mean, we didn't take the politics into consideration in terms of carrying out our mission. You know, we've been through, you know, 18 plus years of war uh, in some pretty difficult circumstances. That doesn't mean we don't have views, but it's really rare that they're expressed. Um, so I'm, uh, I, I recognize that. I think. So uh, why now? Do you think it's these 18 years of war that is just fraying the nation and causing uh, people to speak up in this but way? But Jennifer, it's not why now. I mean, this happened after Iraq because Iraq was 
really tough. In fact, that was almost to me a seminal point where retired, uh, in particular, retireds came out, uh, and in many cases, they're paid, you know, to speak for whatever media outlet they're speaking uh, for, and to speak pretty strongly against the president and against the president's policies. It happened with Bush, it happened with Obama, and it's happened again with Trump. So I don't think it is why now. One of the things I worry about this uh, uh, that r has concerned me for years is, is that we are teaching our young ones that it's okay to do this. So when they get out, they can do the same thing. And I just think it's fundamentally bad for the country. Um, we're not a country where the military writes the ship. You wouldn't want to live in those countries. I, I wouldn't want to live in those countries. Uh, this, is up, this is up to the, the American people uh, and the civilian leadership to make sure the ship gets right. And I recognize that's a huge challenge. And believe me, I'm as concerned as anybody with where we are right now in terms of the institutions which are getting destroyed. But also, this has been, a, this has been on on track for a while. This isn't just about the 2016 election. I've watched the politics in Washington for the last 20 years just get tougher and tougher and tougher. More and more things get politicized. For crying out loud, whenever it was, a month ago or two months ago, we politicized the weather service. <laughs> if, you know, there just is nothing these days that doesn't somehow get politicized. And I think we politicize our military at our peril. Let's spec, uh, step back and look at what's happening in Syria. The president just said, we never gave a commitment to the Kurds. Defense Secretary Mark Esper echoed, we had no obligation, if you will, to defend the Kurds from a longstanding NATO ally, Turkey. I spoke to General Mazloum, the head of the SDF, the YPG uh, Kurd, Kurdish commander on the ground last night. And he told me, as disappointed as he is, he still would prefer to fight with the Americans. He hoped that President Trump would change his mind. And what is your reaction to the decisions the president has made recently? And when you hear those kind of statements, we never gave a commitment to the Kurds. What is your reaction? How do we understand what we're seeing? We've been committed to the Kurds in my life since the 90s. I mean, there are those that would argue that it was the no-fly zones that we put in place, uh, and we did a great deal to make sure that the Kurds in northern Iraq uh, were able to both be stable and sustain themselves over time, first of all. Secondly, my interactions with Turkey uh, over time, but both in NATO uh, as well as uh, these wars, that, uh, that the Turks, the Turkey's leadership, Erdogan in particular, uh, would, and I think they now have a wide open uh, door, uh, they would take out, they would kill every Kurd they possibly could, and they'd label them all PKK. We underestimate. How did we stop them then? Well, I think we stopped them by not doing what we're doing, which was. No, but uh, how did we stop them in the past when they'd come across into Iraq? Because they've been doing this for some time. No, I understand that. And in fact, uh, you know, we, we address that over time from the standpoint of the the the, and there are some terrorists that are inside the PKK, but every Kurd is not a PKK member, and that's the broad brush that Turkey paints. And, and what I worry about now is that's what's going to happen. There's going to be an, uh, an awful lot of Kurds that get killed by, uh, by the Turks, and it's a, it's a wide open runway for Erdogan and his troops specifically. Uh, but we engaged on these issues, and the Turks knew that we were supportive of the Kurds, not supportive of the PKK. And, what was the other? I think the other one was the YPG. I mean, the two that that they call terrorist groups. Um, uh, but we we were there first of all. Secondly, they knew there were limits on how far they could go, and now there are no limits. One, we're not there, and two, there are no limits. Secondly, I think it's just too easy to say that we we didn't have a commitment. I mean, we've been fighting with them now for four years. It took us an enormous amount of effort to put this coalition together against all odds, quite frankly, started with Obama and, and put it together under Trump. And it had an extraordinary impact. When you look at the footprint, the tens of thousands that were in this group together uh, and what they were able to sort of stabilize, which is now all going to come unglued from my perspective. Everybody we would want to lose in this is going to win. Putin's going to win in Russia, Assad's going to win in Syria, ISIS is going to win, Erdogan's going to win, Iran's going to win, and we and our friends are going to lose.
Do you think the American military raised the expectations of the Kurdish leaders and the Kurdish people, made false promises, knowing that eventually they would have to leave? No, I don't think so. I, I think the American military, I mean, I, I'm not there every day, I, you know, as I used to be, so I'm a little wary of what I think the American military, saying what the American military thinks. Uh, I think my experience is American military leaders are pretty practical about what's going on, so that I don't think they would have raised expectations. Uh, they would have been, it's pretty amazing when you consider uh, that coalition, if you will, uh, across you know, what they've done uh, with a total of 2,000 troops uh, in, uh, in Syria has been pretty amazing. And, uh, and they would never, at least I, I don't think, it's not my experience that they'd ever overpromise in that regard. But they certainly would not expect on either side uh, with, uh, with the, uh, the Kurds, uh, the, the FSA, anybody that's involved in that, they certainly would not expect on their side or our side to be there on Monday and Tuesday be gone. Do you believe that the president green-lighted, either through words, actions, body language, for the Turkish military to come across? Because there are military leaders in the Pentagon, uh, Esper, uh, for one, who says that they had no choice. There were 15,000 Turkish troops. It was a fait accompli by the time they had the phone call. What is your assessment of what President Trump did or didn't do? Erdogan would not send those troops across that border if the Americans were there. That's what I believe, specifically. And in that regard, it opened the door. When, when we were gone, it opened the door. And there's nothing, quite frankly, uh, uh, and, and I want to give Turkey credit. Turkey has absorbed a lot of refugees. Turkey has, uh, has foot a big bill during this Syrian crisis. So it's not like everything they've done uh, hasn't been supported. Uh, but there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that their focus, their focus is so heavily on PKK that that's what they want to address and we've now given them you know, a wide open lanes to do exactly that. And so, I, think the, I think the results are gonna be really tragic. So does Turkey have a point in terms of the differences in the Kurdish groups? PKK is a uh, State Department listed terror group. Right. Uh, they, then there's the YPG, which Tony Thomas, who was the head of Special Operations Command, admitted in public that it was commanders on the ground who changed the name of the YPG when the US military decided to team up with them and called them the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces. It was a rebranding of the YPG, which the, everybody knew the Turks believed yeah. were, if not the same as PKK, cousins of yeah. the PKK. Yeah. So didn't the U.S. know that this was a very difficult marriage, that eventually they were going to have to face Turkish concerns, and what was the plan to deal with that, yeah. and was that a mistake? Well, f I, I think there, I don't think there's any question, you know, my guess would be they understood eventually they were going to have to deal with this, but given the coalition that was put together and the impact of it and the stability that it created, it seems to me it would have given us time to figure out how to deal with that, with Turkey as opposed to uh, as opposed to just pulling out and and in fact the de facto result of that decision was to let Turkey deal with it and and kill as many as they possibly could and that's what they're going to do do you believe this will lead to ethnic cleansing of the Kurds I don't know I'm not sure mm -hmm. I mean those are all you know the genocide piece the electric the ethnic cleansing piece is a uh, is a, th those are pretty harsh words, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do believe that they're gonna, they're gonna kill a lot of them. Mm -hmm. If you were looking at the decision, try to put into context for our audience, what are the immediate tactical results of this decision in the last two weeks, and what are the strategic uh, implications? Well, I think the, the, the tactical results will be that, that they're gonna they're going to clean a lot of that out. I think we've seen, I think it's the FSA, you know, immediately. Explain the FSA. The Free Syrian Army, which was sort of the core of this coalition. Uh, and they, they looked to Assad immediately uh, in their own country, which would have been the last person in the world that they would look to 
uh, to protect them, uh, um, and uh, they actually had nowhere else to go. Don't you think the so, Turks will probably use the Free Syrian Army as proxies to carry out if it's ethnic cleansing or attacks on Kurds? They're going to use them so that their military itself does not have to I be, don't leave film. I, I don't know that they would do that. I mean, that may, that may be the plan. I haven't heard anybody talk about that at this point in time. So I think this gives uh, enormous power back to Assad. You know, that's both tactical and strategic in a country that I thought would never come back together, actually, uh, after what it went through. Um, uh, I think it, it goes back to, and you served in the Middle East, so you know, uh, one of the things the Israelis have feared forever is this, what I would call sort of this bridge from Tehran to Beirut, and a lot of that goes through Syria, and I think it opens that uh, up again. I have been surprised that I haven't seen, not that he doesn't have his challenges, I haven't seen more out of Netanyahu specifically, although I think he still is the prime minister, although they're struggling coming up with a government. But that bridge is something that the Israelis always wanted to break, uh, so that you couldn't, you didn't have those lanes to ship all the weapons and support for Hezbollah. So I think and that's somebody else that wins is is Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon and and uh, what's his name, Naz, uh, Nasrallah. And that's it. really why the U.S. military has agreed to, and the president has agreed to keep 200 troops at the Atanf base in southern Syria. It's to stop the Iranian. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Forces. yeah, I saw the president speak to that today. Um, but it's, it has really, uh, I would say, uh, strategically, it's almost taken us back to where we were 10 or 15 years ago in terms of that. And uh, with the exception of anybody that was on our side would wonder, will we be on our side, on their, on their side in the future? Um, because, you know, we've pulled out from our friends in this particular arrangement. Uh, and I think that's a global question. That's not just uh, in Syria itself. What should we make of President Erdogan going to see President Putin tomorrow in Sochi? I think it's just continuing the relationship. Uh, I mean, it's very but clear. But this is a NATO ally. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. I understand that. Um, I mean, Erdogan's got some, he's got some challenges. I can't, I don't know what the number is right now. Maybe somebody in the audience knows, but a significant amount of his his uh, economy thrives on trade with Europe, uh, and he's never been able. At least I haven't seen his ability to be able to sort of turn away from that. There was a point seven eight years ago when he really was trying to lean into Iran to see if he could economically, if he could displace some of what was happening in Europe with Iran, and it didn't work out. I suspect there's a lot there's there's a, there's going to be a military component with. Uh, Russia, obviously, the the missiles that he's that he's getting is one. But I mean, I think we are losing him. And then the question the question becomes is, does he stay in NATO? I, that's a big decision. That's what do something... you think? Do you think that it is something the allies should be debating right now? Yes. I, well, I think I, I think to to see Turkey leave NATO is a huge, huge decision, and I would not want to do that or have that happen precipitously. Um, uh, I mean, actually, I was encouraged a few months ago when the election took place, the second election, two elections took place for the mayor in Istanbul, which shows there's some resistance, if you will, into, you know, in the political world, and that's sort of the heart of his political world. So I just want, I don't want to, I wouldn't want to rush here to judgment about them in the future. They've been an ally for a long time, geographically. Uh, from a you know the only Muslim country, they're, they're almost a you know they're they're a bridge to the Middle East in many ways. I just want to be really careful about that. Is there even a mechanism within NATO to either sanction Turkey, punish it, or even push it out of NATO? Well, I, how does that work? Actually, I don't know. I, 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 I haven't been able to get. An I mean, I was in NATO a long time. We never we never had to address the issue of getting rid of somebody. Uh, it just wasn't discussed. It was much more, can we bring other countries in? I, what, I would suspect there is, but I just What about a mechanism it's... for punishing a member of NATO, keeping them in, but... Well, there, there... there may be, but yeah. I'm not Hard sure what it would be. So did you ever face a similar situation when you were chairman of the Joint Chiefs where the president gave you either an order or an indication that was against his military advice, and what did you do? I did, and I carried it out. 
That's what, what we do. <laughs> well, I mean, we have the debate. The system is you have the debate internally. The duly elected president of the United States by the American people makes the decision and we carry it out. In fact, I try to use George Marshall because Marshall, to me, is, is, was, is one of my idols. And what Marshall said at one point about this question, in fact, the more I disagree with the policy decision, the more I act like I support it to send a message. But is that what military leaders are doing right now? Yeah. Um, the active duty ones? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have I think, they told you? I that? think Chairman. I think Chairman Milley will do exactly what he's told to do. Make sure you know, get the twenty six out, whoever they are. Make sure they get out safely. You know, and then take whatever the next steps are going to be. Sure. The incident that you're referring to, are you talking about the pullout from Iraq? Because it seems to me there are quite uh, parallels to when President Obama pulled out rather precipitously from Iraq. Yeah, I think, I think the lessons of, and I've thought about this you know, more in the last few days because of Syria, we, we need to learn from, one, how easy it is to get into war and how hard it is to get out. So in Iraq, we got out, in my view, principally because the president had promised this in his campaign. It was a cam campaign promise. There were specifics that facilitated, we couldn't get a, a SOFA with them, a, a, a status of forces agreement with them, that, that precipitated. But it fit very nicely with the political piece. But doesn't that sound very then, similar to what on, President Trump hang, just did? No, hang on, hang on. <laughs> so, so uh, and then obviously, you know, we had the ISIS resurgence, uh, or uh, the, the ISIS surge that, that came out of that. We are going through a similar debate right now in Afghanistan. Um, it's very clear President Trump doesn't want troops overseas in these quote unquote endless wars. There are a ton of terrorist groups in that border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and who's going to make sure they don't uh, hit us in, in some way? Some of them are aspirational, some of them are operational. They all don't like us a lot, and that's an art national interest, I think vital national interest actually there. That said, uh, we're, you know, we are tied to what the president has said. I think it's very possible that we go to zero there as well. Uh, and you could argue it's been a really tough fight in both those places and we've had our ups and downs. There's no question. We get it in Syria. We finally get it about right where it's almost a you know, it's, it's stable, uh, different from Afghanistan, different from Iraq in that regard, and it was a very tough fight, and yet we make a decision to pull out because of the, po my own view, because of the politics of it, uh, because that's what he said he would do. So we have, a, we have a very difficult time figuring out how to get out of what we start or what we get involved in, even at a relatively small level, in Syria compared to the number of troops we had in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, so I, it, it appears to me that's exactly what he's doing, uh, that it politically it fits very well. It certainly did with President Obama. And then what's he going to do? What is President Trump going to do with respect to Afghanistan? I wouldn't be surprised to see him pull out of there as well. From what I understand, there's already, I think, 2,000 troops who have quietly left Afghanistan in the last few months as part of that draw, drawing down. They were already seeing it starting. Well, I've seen for, for weeks or months, I've seen this number 8,600, and we're 14 now, 12, yeah. counting those two coming out. So I would certainly expect us to get down to 8,600, and after that, I'm just not sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you How about were, North Korea, General? Let's talk about North Sorry. Korea. <laughs> let's, let's pivot to Asia, if you will. Uh, <laughs> How close were we to nuclear war with North Korea? Uh, we were closer than I want to be. Uh, I've worried about, I worry about that peninsula have for a long time as a place that is potentially the most explosive uh, and violent place uh, in the world and, and the speed with which that can happen. Uh, I, I, Kim Jong-un is you know, a very clever fellow. He's a bad guy. All my contacts tell me nothing has happened. 
in the negotiations. So we're not, we're not in better shape than we were. Uh, I, I, am, I, I recognize that President Trump's style is a little different, but you don't have to look very long in history to see you know, the number of presidents have tried to deal with North Korea, uh, administration after administration after administration, and nothing, nothing comes out of that effectively in the end. So I didn't begrudge that he tried it this way, or I don't begrudge that, particularly if he can succeed. It's just that I haven't heard any significant steps being taken to denuclearize. And I think him with a nuclear weapon, uh, and I lay a lot of this on China as well. China's sort of just laid back on this and said, we can't do anything about it. I don't agree with that. They can do a lot. They actually control the money going in and out of that country, and they could squeeze him very hard. But I think in the end, that, ha I, that has to happen. I think North Korea with nuclear weapons or more nuclear weapons with this guy is a, a, is a real danger to stability in that part of the world. And we should remember, uh, or I try to recall, the four of the five biggest economies in the world are centered there. So stability there is really critical. Um, is it more or less stable after three years of the Trump administration? I think it's, I think it's what it was. I don't think it's, I, it, I mean, we've had, I don't know what the right word is. We've had a degree of stability there for a long time, but we have <clears throat> this family in North Korea that cycles us through this actually pretty well-known uh, you know, threat, forgiveness, send them money, threat. I mean, it's a well-known cycle, and we respond to it. And it's obviously, I mean, a lot of smart people try to figure this out. We've not been able to do, we haven't been able to figure out what the right answer is. And do you think he might pull troops out of South Korea? He's threatened at times. Uh, I haven't heard that lately. what would that do? Well, I, I mean, we go to this troop thing, and I recognize it's different. I, I do think, you know, it's not lost on me that we've got thousands of troops in Germany after World War II, there for a long time, for lots of reasons. We've had thousands, I think the number in South Korea now is 28,500. 28, uh, you know, we've had stability there, which then gets me to, you know, troops in these other countries where we've been at war, is it worth the small number of thousand to create the kind of stability or maybe a, a, a road, a bridge to longer term stability in these countries that we've been at war in. And you know, I'm inclined to use the examples, not at that level necessarily, because we had at one point tens of thousands certainly in Europe, and we're not there anymore uh, in, in the l large numbers that we were, we brought a lot home. So I, I certainly wouldn't, I think, I wouldn't recommend that at this particular point in time. Let's talk about Ukraine and the issue of arms sales being held up for political reasons. Yeah. Um, from your point of view, did that happen on, on your watch? Is it normal? And what what uh, should be done if if everything is proven to be true in terms of? I don't ever remember that happening uh, when I was on active duty, and I did a lot of. I mean, I was involved in an awful lot of. Uh, systems that would go to, and weapons that would go to various countries. I mean, the idea that you would use this for political gain in our own country, just I just never saw it. I never saw it. And what should happen if it is proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is what happened? That's up to the Congress of the United States of America. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> Your strategy in Afghanistan that you helped put together, yeah. do you have any regrets about that strategy, looking back and seeing how very little has really changed in what Afghanistan? I, yeah, I, I do, in, in a sense that um, we, we have a tendency, or certainly I'll speak for myself, despite being handed the book, you know, The Graveyard of Empires, uh, I was handed by the Pakistani ambassador to the U.S. as I took over the chairman's job, a book uh, uh, that was about 90 pages, um, and it was the British report on that border from 1948. And he says, you need to read this. I said, why? He says, because nothing has changed yeah. in that border. Um, and we're not very good historians in our country, at least uh, I'm not for sure. I wish I knew now, I've been teaching at Princeton for six years, and I'm now teaching leadership at the Naval Academy. And you get time to reflect and read as you prepare for class on these kinds of things. 
there are certainly things I wish I knew then that I know now. Um, uh, like the, what? Like the, what? Well, Jumps I wish I understood more about degree of difficulty in a place like Afghanistan and really understood it, not, not just had somebody say it, but what does that really mean uh, uh, would be one. I, I, um, I go to, two th actually 2003, uh, I'm, a, I'm the Navy money guy, the three star on the Navy staff, uh, and I come home one night and my wife has picked up um, Tom Friedman's book called From Beirut to Jerusalem. And she's, and it's a page turner. And, and we sit down at dinner and she puts this book down in front of me and she goes, do you think anybody's read this book? Uh, about how complicated it is from a history standpoint and a culture standpoint. So I wish I, uh, I regret that I hadn't understood all of that better, even to the degree that I understand it now. Um, uh, the other thing that, that I regret from a government perspective, and I worry a great deal about it, it's way, it's far too, it's too easy to go to war. The weapons are more lethal and more precise and more dangerous than they've ever been. They're too easy to use. Um, uh, we've had this incredible surge and pull of power into the White House for a long time, uh, and it's more powerful now than it ever has been. Congress, in my view, has not stood up uh, as, it, as it has needed to uh, in, in many situations, uh, and that tension obviously will continue. But in the Afghanistan piece in particular is that that it really wasn't a whole of government approach. And the military became too much of the lead as opposed to part of the overall strategy to fight corruption, to <coughs> create <coughs> some semblance of a rule of law, uh, to, uh, to, to get to some level of good governance uh, and have the kind of e economic potential potential impact so that people's lives could actually get better. Uh, I've said, many of us have said, but I've said it for a long time, you can't kill your way to victory in any of these wars. Uh, so should the U.S. pull out of Afghanistan? No, not now. No, be, not from my perspective, uh, this was two years ago. I was at a, I was at a, a dinner with, uh, at a gala with Joe Dunford, and we happened to be sitting back to back and before it got started I was just talking with him and he said, so we were talking about Afghanistan and Joe served there for a year as the four star in charge of it at one point and he said, and I was not unfamiliar as you know with that border in Pakistan and the degree of difficulty there as well. But basically the numbers he used was 21 of the 62 terrorist organizations in the world who threaten us live here. So, so, we, so we bail from there at our, at a, I consider to be a very high risk. Yeah. Let's go back to uh, Russia and Syria. Could the president be right that by pulling out of Syria, he's sucking Russia into a quagmire as Russia was sucked into Afghanistan and then eventually, or the Soviet Union was sucked into Afghanistan? If that is his long-term vision, could he be right? I think it's, I think it's, uh, it, at this point, it's basically just speculation. Uh, at least uh, the individuals I engaged with uh, in Russia, and I spent a fair amount of time with not just my counterpart, but many Russians in my time, was they learned an awful lot of lessons in Afghanistan. So, uh, and you could argue we learned a lot about Vietnam, and, and then we ignored them when the time came uh, in a place like Iraq um, and Afghanistan. So I suppose it's possible, uh, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't count on it. I mean, for me, Iran, Syria, those two in particular, they were, they've had long-standing uh, relationships with the Soviet Union and with Russia. And so I felt for some time, and this was, I think, a, this was a geostrategic miss on the part of the Obama administration. Russia was going to get into Syria, one way or the other. Uh, I would have preferred it to be diplomatically and economically, but at, at some point in time, Putin was going to engage, and he was going to be he was going to need to be engaged to generate a solution. Uh, I would have just hoped that we could have done that politically and diplomatically uh, earlier than actually physically when the military showed up. So 
they have been, they don't have a lot of friends. Uh, Syria is one of them, and obviously he's saved Assad, so that's going to continue, and the same is true with Iran, and we should just recognize that as we figure out how we're going to move in the future. Before we go to questions, I just, my last question is, what is the greatest threat to our democracy right now? Actually, I think the, uh, um, and when I was asked this in 2010, I said our debt, yeah. and for the record, our debt at that point in time was about 10 trillion. And so for all you young people, we've done nothing. And it's now 23 trillion. Uh, and there are people actually now on both sides of the aisle, not just Larry Summers, that are writing, it's okay. It's not okay. At some point in time, that's gonna come home to roost. And I worry about that for my kids and my grandkids. But I actually think right now, uh, the greatest threat is sort of the, is the, uh, uh, is the internal, the destruction of the institutions uh, that have uh, served us so well for so long. Uh, I worry that the, the domestic uh, vitriol that, is, that, that I see, certainly in my lifetime, I recognize we're 243 years old or whatever it is and that there have been difficult times before what was missing back then that is very much in evidence right now is the ability to amp it up because of social media instantaneously. And so I, I worry that we're a country in decline. It is mostly, not exclusively, but mostly domestically. We're destroying the institutions that have served us well. We've got an education system that isn't serving our young people very well, certainly the, the K through 12 system. We're deep in debt. Uh, We've got infrastructure issues. We, we've got political issues we cannot solve. I get the immigration piece, but uh, we've, we, this immigration issue has been building for a long time. It isn't just happened in the last couple of years, even though I'm appalled by how it's being handled right now. Um, and we need to fix those things. <clears throat> those are all, I, I think in total, they're existential to the country, not any, indi not any one individually. So I agree with the president. We have spent a ton of money overseas, and there's a lot of stuff we need to fix back here, and we need to invest here. But I don't think we should isolate ourselves, because I think if we do that, try isolating ourselves from the rest of the world, what's out there that is bad for us and bad for our friends, to the degree we have any left when this is done, uh, will, will come home to roost. Thank you, Admiral yeah. Mullen. Okay, so we'll go to some questions. We have, uh, we're gonna start with students. Um, if you wanna head up to the mics, we have about 20 minutes to take questions. Okay, who would like to start? Hi, my name's Yao, uh, second year in sociology. So recently, uh, China showcased its military capability in its parade, and there are two weapons that are given a lot of press domestically. One is Dongfeng 41, uh, the uh, ballistic missile, and another one is uh, Julan 2, which is a submarine launched ballistic missile. So, what is your assessment of these two uh, new weapons, and uh, what will uh, U.S. react to this potential capability, and particularly what U.S. would shape its policy in the area of South China what is Sea? It, what, is it, what was the first one? Uh, first one is is it DF-41? DF what did you call it? Boom Boom? Uh, Dongfeng boom boom 41. Okay. It's just yeah. a new weapon. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm delightfully not as current on my weapons as I used to be, uh, but I know, I know those two. Actually, I'll speak to those in terms of their development of their military. They're coming fast. They're spending a ton of money. Um, uh, I think it's going to be a while, quite frankly, before uh, they, can, they can match us. Two things, though. One, uh, they don't need to develop the, the human skills as much as we have historically because technology does a lot of this for them. That's one. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and the other is they have seemingly a limitless budget to continue to do this. What, so I'm really concerned about that. And they would have us leave, one of my counterparts, I don't know, 2010, said to me, I was talking to him, and he goes, uh, he goes, you know, that Pacific's a big ocean. Why don't we just draw a line right down the middle of it, and you take everything east of that line, and I'll take everything west of that line. You know, they want us gone. 
Uh, and they haven't been very smart about co-opting their neighbors who they deal with, and the neighbors are economically very dependent on them, but they are really squeezing them hard. I think our presence is critical. We need to stay out there. I think we've given Putin in Russia and Xi Jinping in China far too much runway, and we need to stop. We need to draw some very clear lines with them and say enough is enough and push back, start pushing back pretty hard. We also have, and I'm somebody that's, I, historically I believed in economic development. When economies thrive, generally it's in more stable parts of the world and the work for the military is reduced. So I'm hoping uh, you know, that we can continue in a way that where economies actually do thrive but they're developing their military, and in many, many ways they're copying us. They're developing a blue water navy. They're not that good yet. They're better than they used to be. Um, uh, but they're also heavily focused on these, what I call gray war, gray zone capabilities. The cyber capability, the space capability, uh, the, electron, the, the electronic, electronic, electromagnetic uh, spectrum capability, and we need to be pretty careful about that as well. And, and to me, this century, more than any other relationship, the most important relationship in the world between two countries is the one between U.S. and China. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Admiral Mullen. I'm yeah. Wolf. I'm a third year uh, philosophy major. Uh, I want to ask you about a report. I don't know if you've seen. It's a Turkish report, actually, or a Turkish boast, uh, maybe, that there's 28 groups or militias that make up this Free Syrian army. Uh, this, this sort of mercenary force that's doing the brunt of the invasion of, of the Kurds right now. And the report says that 21 of them, 21 of the 28, were previously the, uh, the recipients of either American training or funding or arming. Yeah. Um, and that was sort of a, a CIA gig, not an army or a Navy one, but kind of an Obama-era consensus policy. So I wonder if you could assess that um, in light of what's happened now. Well, I can't. Do you know about the report? I mean, I, Jennifer I don't, is I don't more know, up to but, speed on these than I I don't know about the frankly. report, but I, do, oh, I, I, but I think your, your question or, is yeah. fair whether the report exists or not. That Free Syrian Army, yeah. at one point in time, uh, was favored by the CIA, given weapons, and then we shifted gears, and the policy became to work with the YPG, which was rebranded the SDF, and so this Free Syrian Army is an interest. If, if it's made up of some of those groups that the U.S. trained, there probably is some truth to that. But you were... were I you? rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to be answering questions. No, I know that. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Eric. I'm a first year in the college. I had a question about the term endless war. Um, I feel like it gets thrown around, thrown around a lot in politics, and I was wondering what you consider to be an endless war. Was the troop engagement in Syria an example of endless war, and what are the implications of that term being thrown around by politicians? Well, I think it's, you know, metaphorically is it's never going to end, and can we ever get out? And he's very specifically saying, yes, I promised I would, and he's going to end it physically. By, I don't know if he's going to end the war, but it means bring the troops home, which, which, which ends the war technically on the spot. I don't think it's over you know, in the area, and, he, and he's comfortable with saying, and somebody else can fight that. Let the locals out there who live out there fight that. And that's a pretty consistent philosophy with him. Uh, I get the point, these have taken certainly a whole lot longer than anybody anticipated. You're probably too young, but I mean, when we went into Iraq, you know, we were gonna be back, I think it was in three months. Mm, yeah. Three months was what was, you know, and, and obviously that didn't happen. Uh, and we go to war now, they don't, they're not short wars. I sort of put them in just empirically 10 years at a crack, and in some cases longer than that, they take a long time, uh, which gets to the seriousness of how serious a decision it is for any president to make a decision to go to war. So it's hard, it's, 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 and I go back to what I said earlier, I guess, it's, it's too easy to start them and it's too hard to end them. Also, they're not really bringing those troops home. They're repositioning them in Iraq, and the president just sent 2,000 troops to Saudi Arabia. So how does that fit with this ending endless wars? It's hard to tell. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Admiral. Hi. The, um, the time after 2001, after 9-11, yeah. and the U.S. invasion, 
the amount of information about Afghanistan as a people, and the Afghan people who were by and large not very educated yeah. and they're divided into tribes, do you feel now that with all the elementary education that has been done there, is that are the people of Afghanistan becoming united even though the Taliban are there? Are they are they much more of a one one country now than they were 20 years ago? I don't think they're that much more. I think that, I mean they really are a tribal nation. Um, I think what's different and what we tried to do was to put together some version of a government in Kabul that could be responsible for the country. That said, they're never, my view is they're never going to function based on some strong central government per se. The, uh, the challenge that we've had over time is, uh, is how do you prevent the Taliban from taking over again, which, which not many Afghans want, quite frankly. Uh, and then how do you deal with the how do you deal with the terrorist groups that live on that border per se? And there are some metrics, girls in school. I mean, there are some things that have certainly gotten better, but it's been much more of a struggle than we anticipated. Thank Were you. you in favor of negotiating with the Taliban? Was I? Yes. Yeah. I, I don't have much time for Kabul leadership. Oh. Didn't with Car didn't with Karzai. Don't with Ghani. Mm -hmm. I don't think they can deliver their country. Although Karzai wants to come back, from what I hear. But by negotiating with the Taliban, would you be handing the country over to the Taliban? As no, uh, no. No. How did? No. Mm -hmm. No, no, not at all. Mm -hmm. I think. But bringing them into the government. I think it's some, yeah, to some degree, certainly not to run it, to some degree, you know, a place in the governance structure, yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, Admiral Mullen. Thank you for being here. Hi. Um, President Obama called ISIS the JV team. Uh, and it just grew under his presidency. Under the Trump administration, um, they have lost much of their land and influence in that region. What, what did President Trump do differently that President Obama should have done? Well, I think President Obama wanted to come home out of Iraq, which is what he did. Um, and I think he regrets that statement. I think he was wrong. It, they're obviously not a JV team. And I think what started to happen at the end of his administration and then certainly what happened with the Trump administration was an awful lot of, uh, 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 the, we, we, we kludged this group together uh, that had a massive impact on ISIS. That said, they're not gone. Uh, they came back once and I worry a great deal that they'll come back again. There's nobody, there's nobody that's saying ISIS is gone. Uh, so we, we're going to have to face that again, one way or another. Um, uh, and I give, I mean, uh, believe me, I give President Trump and what Jim Mattis and what the military leadership has done, along with our friends, uh, and, you know, friends, we could talk a long time about friends in the Middle East. Um, uh, what our friends have done has been pretty extraordinary to get it to this position. I just, I just really worry that we're unplugging it very rapidly. I mean, there's still 10,000 ISIS uh, fighters in prisons that are being guarded yeah. by the Kurds that the U.S. just um, left. Some analysts say that Erdogan several years ago uh, provoked more indiscriminate attacks on Kurds to uh, build up his own uh, like nationalist support for his electoral politics. So I wonder how much uh, the uh, cooperation or alliance between Turkey and Russia, which goes against the grain of several hundred years of national interest logic, is based on rulers who uh, are really not acting in the interests of their nations. And we can say that that might be Trump as well as Putin and Erdogan. Well, I think Erdogan thinks he's acting in the interest of his nation. I, I'm not fond of him. Uh, but when you look at what he's done when he came in, I think in 2004, and what he's been able to do politically in that country, it's pretty extraordinary. He's a master. He's a, he's a master. And I've actually, I've actually sat with him, uh, just the two of us, and he's one of a handful of people in really small numbers in my life where he, he is almost messianic to me, uh, specifically. He gives you that, that sort of look. And like him or not, he's really good at what he does. So. 
that he used that he used that, and this goes to the question Jennifer asked earlier, that he used the Kurds, sorry, the PKK, YPG, attacking the Kurds to help himself politically doesn't surprise me. And, and, and doing it in a way that I think is pretty indiscriminate, and that's what I worry about is gonna happen right now. And it's less, to me, I, I mean, we'll have to see where Putin goes on this, quite frankly. Uh, I, Putin doesn't have, I think Putin, Putin's strategic view is to return to the great power table. He doesn't have a lot of resources to do that. He wants the near abroad in pretty good shape, but that, that Vladimir Putin's gonna try to reshape the entire Middle East, that is a quagmire. And, and that is something that, that uh, he's gonna spend a lot, of, lot, a lot more time and money on than I think he has, if, if that's what he's gonna do. So I don't worry about that as much. He will take care of Syria and he'll make sure Iran does okay as well. Hi, um, my name is Rahul, and I'm a PhD student in the Biological Sciences Division. And thank you for your talk, Admiral Mullen. My, my question is about US policy in Afghanistan. Um, ever since the collapse of the Silk Road, um, it's been very hard to establish a strong central government in Afghanistan. And some historians have, set, have attributed to this to a revenue issue. Since the few periods of times when Afghanistan has had a strong central government, they've had to use some sort of external revenue source um, to, to kind of subsidize control of the tribal yeah. areas. Yeah. So my question is, to what extent should U.S. policy in Afghanistan focus on reestablishing an internal revenue source for the country, and might that involve reestablishing some of the historic trade routes that you know, fell into dis disarray centuries ago? I think that's a, it's a great question, and I think long-term in, in some I almost idealistic way that we'd like it to turn out, that would be a requirement. I mean, to go back to what I said about economic st stability and thriving economies, and I, I don't know where Afghanistan is now, but it used to be, not that long ago, the second poorest per capita country in the world, so I'm sure it has moved up a lot. Um, I still have, a, and, and you're right, there have been central governments there that have done okay, but they, and they've been at war since 1970, yeah. I think. I mean, it's been 50 years. Um, so not many people, I mean, that, that's sort of been their life. Is it even possible for that central government to, you know, to reemerge in a way? If it's going to be stable uh, and if they're going to have a better future, what you're saying actually has to happen. And I think the international community needs to step up to facilitate that. Part of the, and, and the international community in many ways needs to be led by India in a constructive way not a destructive way or in a focus on Pakistan way, which is another whole uh, issue that's really, really tough, uh, in a responsible way. And India's got a lot of challenges internally as well. But that, th the economic lifelines have to be created, I think. And at one point in time, they were there. Couldn't China play a bigger role in Afghanistan? Wouldn't that be less threatening to Pakistan? Um, y yes, except I think in its own way, Afghanistan is an extension of India, and China is very wary of India. So I'd, I'd look, I'd, if Modi and Xi Jinping can figure out how to start working together, maybe you could extend it into Afghanistan in that regard. Yeah, my name is uh, Ernie Norman. I'm an alum and an IOP groupie, and uh, thank you very much for an interesting and informative talk. Thanks, Ernie. Uh, my question has to do with. Uh, uh, primarily with troop strength. troop strengths. I think we have perhaps technologically the most advanced military in the world and probably will for a little while longer. Yeah. But on the other hand, our troop strengths are way, way down. And can we really use our military as a, uh, a foreign policy tool with the very weak numbers of troop, uh, troops that we have? And related to that, would you advocate a national service draft of some sort, not just for the military, but for other th things as well, maybe CETA, Peace Corps, et cetera, and the military to, to uh, fill this out a little bit. Well, it's interesting. I actually, you and I would probably have to discuss this for a while because I don't, don't agree with you in terms of our current troop strength. I worry about our military, which is less, it's all volunteer force, it's less than, it's about half of 1% and fewer and fewer people in America know much about it. And it comes from 
more and more concentrated places and more and more concentrated uh, economic zones, if you will, you know, lower middle class, that kind of thing. Um, uh, so I, where I am, which is not uncontroversial, particularly for my army friends, the army today is 450,000, some number like that. Uh, I want to reduce the army by 100,000. Uh, and I disagree with Bob Gates, who said years ago, the next president or next sec def would be crazy to put 100,000 troops somewhere. Uh, and the reason I do is because we have, we're batting 000, zero since 1983, predicting where we would get into conflict. And so I don't want to take the possibility that we might have to do that if it's in our vital national interest to do that. So I want the army big enough, 350, don't, don't check my math here, Jennifer, but I mean, some number like that, but down 100,000. The other thing is these wars don't last three months, they last a decade or more. So I could put 100,000 somewhere, and, they'd, and then they'd be there for a year, but now I gotta relieve them. And to relieve them, I'd have to call up a half a million kids. And I want, so I wanna have a draft for that war. This is a discussion I want going on in America if we're, if we're on the verge of going to war. So that that discussion is taking place in the home of every 18-year-old boy or girl at the dinner table, and that those parents say, yes, this is important enough, I'll support this, or no, there's no way, and they take that up there to their representatives, and we actually have a raging debate about whether we're going to war or not. It's too easy, as I've said. Presidency is too powerful, and it is the most important decision a president makes, and a country makes, I would argue. And we have that debate, and if the debate is, yes, we go, then we go, and if it is, and, it, and if it is no, we don't, then no, we don't. That's going to create a much different view of how we go to war. Now, I want the debate. I, I don't know of another mechanism to create it. So in that sense, I want to be small enough to be able to take care of ourselves, certainly. Uh, but if I'm going to go somewhere like that, uh, I've got to draft, uh, let's say, 100,000 kids. Uh, to do that, or I've got to draft a half a million kids to get the 100,000. Because I can leave them there for a year, but I've got to relieve them. So now I need another 100,000 to relieve them, and my ground force isn't big enough to do that. That's a learning for me when I was chairman. Yes, the all-volunteer force is a great force. It's the best I ever saw in 43 years. But there's a political piece of this, that that all-volunteer force gets used for, or used, without having to make hard political decisions. And I want those to be made. Yeah. Hi, Admiral. My name is Vishan. I'm a first year at the college. Thanks for coming. Sure. Uh, my question is about counter-narcotics policy in Afghanistan specifically. So as far as I understand it, the US has been targeting um, a lot of opium production over there to try to stop the Taliban from getting like a larger revenue source. Yeah. Um, but given that. Uh, you said before that you don't think the central government is like a reliable partner or as credible, and given that a lot of the sort of uh, more local leaders are utilizing U.S. assistance and power to like just take out their, their rival tribes, I guess, what do you think the best policy is going forward to combat revenue sources from opium? Are we still doing that? Oh, um, I think we've pulled out of Helmand quite a bit, so I can't imagine that yeah, we're I mean, that this is a, engaged. You're talking I about think it. that's been scaled back quite a bit. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm very familiar with that yeah. in my time because we did a ton of that and it failed. Yeah. Right. Uh, because we couldn't figure out how to put income into pockets yeah. and food on the table for the opium, for the, for the, uh, opium uh, farms, if you will, or fields, uh, those that did it. So, and I haven't heard anything about this in a long time. If we're still doing it, it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult task. Uh, I mean, part of me goes to one of the biggest problems is the supply side, sorry, the demand side, which is here. It's not exclusive here, but it's certainly here. Um, uh, it's just, I've, I have found that to be an extraordinarily difficult task as you've just described it. But it, does, it is fundamentally, it has to be put food on the table for these very poor people. Thank you. We're out of time, but we'll take one more question. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Michelangelo. I'm a first year in the college. Uh, thank you for being here. Hi, Michael, here. yeah. Admiral Mullen. Yeah. Um, 
So if I'm not mistaken, all members of the military take an oath to not only obey orders from the president and their superior officers, but also to defend the Constitution. Correct. Do you believe that there is a point, and how would you define that point, at which members of the military would be, should exercise their own judgment or subjectivity? The, it's a great question, and where I am on that is if you are given an illegal order or an immoral order uh, or an order that fundamentally you know, you're not going to carry out, you disagree with it so strongly, you, you're from an, on the officer corps side and you are defending the Constitution, you're not defending the President, uh, um, then your obligation at that point is to resign and leave the service. And that goes right from from second lieutenants and ensigns all the way to four stars. Um, uh, and that's the, that's the message, uh, and that's the way it gets done. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't believe it is good for us to publicly disobey, or certainly on the active duty side, and this is where we started earlier, disagree with the elected leader, the commander in chief of the country. The, the president's the commander in chief. He's my boss. When I get an order, I carry the order out. If I can't do that, I leave. And I don't leave with a big speech. Uh, I do actually what Mattis did. You know, Mattis and, as sec def, that's essentially what he did. And he wrote a brief, but I thought very potent letter as to why he disagreed. And that's the path. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Excellent questions, a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Admiral Thanks, Mullen, Jennifer. for being here. Thanks. Thanks.